So um, how many were at WebGL Camp 2? Oh, wow. What a closed little fraternity we have here. So um, that, I think, was the first time the world laid eyes on um, Google Body Browser. I think, Damon, you put a video up on YouTube that got watched like seven gazillion times. <laughs> it's up there with Charlie Bit My Fingers and other great works of art. Um, so, um, so that was the first time we saw it. And I remember, um, I think a lot of us were thinking at the time, how's that thing running so bloody fast? <laughs> And I think that's what you're here to talk about today, Vangelis, so just take it away. That's right. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Um, so we're going to try something new now since the projector works. Uh, uh, we're going to ditch Skype for Google Talk. And I'm giving this presentation with, uh, with my colleague Wong Chan, uh, who's in the New York office. Uh, hopefully this will work now. But in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for Wong to connect, uh, So those of you have, who, who were here in the, the last WebGL camp, uh, you've, you've seen Google Body. Uh, how, many, how many in general, how many people have seen Google Body or have run Google Body? OK, a lot of you. Um, how many of you have seen Google Cow? <laughs> Very few. All right, so let's start with that. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, OK. Um, this is Google Cow. Um, <laughs> uh, this this was actually um, it's a bit of a joke. I, I'll go back to to the regular Google Body, but but this is something that we uh, we made as um, as an April April's first uh, for, um, uh, joke when we uh, released uh, the the second version of Google Body, um, and and it uses essentially the same infrastructure and pipeline as the real thing. Uh, but going back to uh, to the real thing. Uh, Google Body, I think I think it can sort of succinctly be described as sort of the, the we, we want to think of it as the, the, the Google Earth of, of the human body. So, so we have a highly detailed uh, human body model um, uh, with a bunch of layers that you can, uh, you can see. If you can peel the layers back, you can see a whole bunch of, uh, you know, what's hiding behind, a whole bunch of organs. Uh, you can select things. Uh, it, it tells you uh, what they are. You can search for things in here. Um, it will find them for you, rotate the camera and all that. Ah, all right, here we have one. Hey, one. Hi. All right, you're on. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you're not on, on, but but we can hear you. Uh, okay. Can you uh, can you see us? Uh, well, I let's see. Let me get the YouTube back up, and then I'll mute the audio. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so, so Google Body was was like Hendrik said. We uh, we sort of, in a way, pre-released it in WebGL Camp too. What happened is that that was before we we actually made the release. The URL was there. I mentioned that the, the name of the project was Body Browser, and some enterprising fellow on the internet uh, discovered that the URL is bodybrowser.googlelabs.com, and started posting it. So the next day we came out with a real blog post, and, and it became public. And that was back in December, um, and sometime. Um, Earlier this spring, uh, we actually released a second version of Google Body, which now includes the, the mail model um, and, and a whole bunch of other UI features. So for example, you, um, you have this, this cool uh, hide tool, so you can start you know, hiding individual layers so as, you, as you poke through the body, and you can, you can go into more detail um, and find stuff in. And, and you can take your links and post them to, uh, to Facebook and Twitter and all that. And, and you can also type notes. Uh, so a whole bunch of a whole bunch of features um, that are built on top of the original idea. Uh, so let me switch back to this guy here. Um, what uh, what we're going to be talking about today is I'm going to give you a very quick sort of overview of, of how Google Body uh, was set up and how how the application runs, and and then one we go into a lot more detail about the mesh compression uh, algorithm that we use, which is which is essentially in the sort of um, one of the more interesting parts of Google Body, and I think I think you're going to find his presentation uh, very interesting. I think it's the first time that we actually talk publicly about this. Um, so, uh, really quickly, the application um, it, it's really a pure HTML and, and JavaScript application. It's all running in the client. It's using WebGL. 
We use WebGL obviously for the 3D parts of it, and then the rest of it is CSS uh, um, and, and regular HTML. That's how we build the UI elements. Um, the original prototype of Google Body was was done with uh, with an off-the-shelf uh, library. We're using uh, we're using SynJS, I think, at the time. Uh, but we quickly realized that that our, our requirements uh, were quite unique. We had uh, a very large mesh to deal with, and the way that we displayed stuff was 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 different than um, a lot of other uh, applications would need to do things. So so we decided to to write it to write the, the at least the, the loading and the rendering code from scratch. Um, so so it was all pure JavaScript, and we also used parts of the TDL library that, that uh, Greg, who's sitting over there. Uh, wrote uh, some some very good helper functions there uh, to help uh, keep the code under control, and uh, internally we use a, we use a local Python server and we would write the code and 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 test it like that, serve it off of our machines. But when it's time to to release, uh, we actually serve the compiled JavaScript code. So if you go and look at the at the source code for Body, you're not going to see a whole lot. And this is this is not really done to to protect the code because the code is you know we, we'd love to to have it open. Uh, but it's mostly for uh, for compacting the code base so uh, it can be transferred quickly to the client. So, so the underlying challenge here for, for this project, the technical challenge really, is that we have an extremely complicated mesh. The model is, is a model that we uh, licensed from a company called Zygote, and it has uh, close to a million and a half triangles, um, and it also has a lot of detail because um, every uh, single entity in the body is, is, uh, is a separate mesh. So, so we have about 1,800 uh, distinct entities. Uh, so essentially, we have this gigantic model that we, first of all, want to, to be able to download really quickly. Then we want to be able to render in, in real time and you know, good performance, even on, on hardware that's not particularly fast. And finally, we don't want to lose the information that we have about the distinct um, entities in that model because this is very useful information. We want to be able to select parts separately. We want to be able to identify them, click on them, and stuff like that. So um, in order to do that, uh, we built um, a bit of a custom pipeline here. And essentially, we, took the, the got, we got the models uh, as a Maya file. Uh, we got them from Zygote. Uh, then we use the Open Collada exporter to export it to a Collada file, and then from that point on, we run a bit of our, our, our own uh, special pipeline that converts the data into the data files that we need. So, so we extract out of it a JSON file that has metadata that contains all the, the entity names. Um, we, uh, we export separately the, the compressed geometry data um, that one is going to talk about, um, and then finally the textures as a separate uh, sort of set of files. And these are the files that actually get fed to the, to the actual application. Like I said, we, um, since we don't, uh, we, we want to be able to render this fast, but we don't want to lose the detail of the entities, um, individual entities. So uh, with 1,800 entities, we couldn't issue 1,800 draw calls every time we wanted to render the scene, obviously. So what we ended up doing was collecting um, entities that were using the same materials, which is essentially the same texture, um, into one large group. So we could issue a single draw call uh, to render a whole bunch of entities at the same time. We ended up with 63 separate, uh, separate draw calls to render the entire human body. Um, but at the same time, in that JSON file I talked to you before, we kept track of exactly um, in, each, in, in these big buckets of, of vertices, which, what's the offset and what's the length of each individual entity which means that we could identify them. We can render them separately if we wanted to. For example, if you select and you want to sort of highlight a specific entity, we could easily do that by just rendering everything in that, um, in that blob before it and everything after it uh, separately. Um, and um, let's see. A and also, we did some packing. We used the 16-bit floating po uh, fixed point for, uh, uh, for the vertex information. Uh, one will we'll cover that in a lot more detail. Uh, maybe an interesting thing before I switch over to one. Part of the reason, like I said, we wanted to uh, to be able to identify the the individual entities is because we wanted to, the user to be able to click on them. Um, um, the way we we did the click to select feature is is kind of interesting. So essentially, what we did is uh, we create a, a separate an off-screen buffer, a frame buffer, that we render into, and the way we render into it. Um, 
is, is different than obviously the way that, that we do it for the main buffer. We take each entity and we color it with a different color and we do that actually by, by creating vertex buffers that contain color values and, and every, every object um, and every entity uh, corresponding in, in that, that uh, vertex buffer has a different color value. So we render essentially the scene exactly the same way the user would see it, but with a different shader. So it just gets a color value, a different color for every entity. And then when the user clicks on something, uh, we essentially do a read pixels operation. We read those values and we find out what color was below the, uh, below the mouse pointer. And that works really well. And, and just to illustrate, um, this is kind of what, what this, this off-screen frame buffer looks like for, for various layers here. You see that there's a lot of detail. Uh, um, and, and this is how this, uh, this really works. Um, and the nice thing is this is all WebGL. It's, it's really easy to, to play around with stuff. So we played with different ideas on how to visualize things. This is a sort of a cheap um, X-ray kind of shader. It's, it's really easy to play around with these things and it's really fun as well. But uh, right now I'll switch it over to, to Juan uh, who was gonna talk to you about the mesh compression. All right. So can you hear me just fine, uh, Vangelis? Yeah, you're perfect. Awesome. So, um, right, how we get the bits uh, from our servers to your browser. Um, and this is all the tricks that I pulled in order to uh, get that to happen. So, uh, first, maybe a little bit about me. Oh, next slide, please, Ringo. Um, sorry, which slide are we at now? Uh, about you. There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, right now, I'm, this is my 20% time. Uh, my full-time project is basically optimizing web search. Um, uh, however, in the past, I have done a lot of uh, computer graphics stuff. At, uh, I was at a company called Actuality Systems, and we did a lot of things for medical visualization. But we also did some pretty, pretty nutty things with uh, volumetric and even holographic displays. Uh, so I have a bit of experience, experience all around the OpenGL stack, um, including apps and uh, even rendering algorithms and such. Um, okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so about this talk, so I'm trying to sync up here. Uh, are we at the about this talk slide? Yeah, yeah, we're number okay. three. Um, okay. The, when I'm, you say I'm, when you say next slide, I'll switch. So you can assume okay. it's switched. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so right, this is um. Yeah, as you can tell, a completely unrehearsed talk. <laughs> uh, so, but what I want to cover is this simple, fast, compact technique. Um, and it's in that order. Like, the most important thing was that it, it's simple. Uh, mostly because, you know, mostly because I didn't really have time to do anything else. Um, I think I can actually describe this, the technique very quickly, but I think it's more important to get into the whys and not just the hows. Um, sort of the sketch of the talk is that first I'm going to talk about so sort of the web web bit of WebGL, sort of like the HTTP technologies in JavaScript, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the constraints you get from you know the GPU side, the GL and WebGL, and then we'll put it together and win. Um, so uh, one one question you might have is like, is this something that you will be able to use yourself? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, right now it's sort of going through this uh, you know patent and open source bureaucracy, but pretty soon I hope to get something out there, and I hope that uh, some of you out there will help contribute. Okay, next slide, please. So um, a quick rehash of some of the stuff that uh, Vangelis mentioned. So uh, 1.4 million triangles. Uh, oh, Vangelis, I think you have the wrong, I think you have the wrong deck. There you are. Um, oh, wrong deck, could, okay. Yeah, could you use the link that I sent you in the thing? Okay. Or did you, uh, is this one? Okay. Yeah. So vital statistics. Whoa, is the... that's a nice effect. <laughs> yeah, we're up. Okay, so uh, go to slide four, which would be vital statistics. Yeah. Okay, this, should, this is all review. Um, the one, uh, I don't know if Vengos pointed it out though, that we're able to achieve um, six bytes per triangle, which is, you know, it's it's pretty mediocre in terms of like the SIGGRAPH state of the art, 
but I think it's it's a lot better than a lot of the obvious alternatives, and was certainly an enabling uh, thing for us to actually ship uh, as quality high quality of product as we did. So next slide. So the first question is like, do we actually have a problem? Um, so like, is this a noteworthy thing? Like, why am I even giving this talk? Uh, so what are part of the thing that we need to talk about is what were the other options? What were the things that we tried or rejected? So next slide. So um, most people are doing some kind of variant of the standard XML HTTP request and response XML or or you use JSON parse or something. Um, it, it's okay, but it it was it was totally choking on our uh, on our models because they were just too big. In fact, in the prototype version, they were substantially smaller and it was just incredibly painful. Uh, basically, you know, the obvious takeaway is that text is is big and slow. So things like the difference between JSON and XML doesn't even matter. It's just the fact that you're actually, you know, you know, writing numbers out in ASCII. Um, so uh, when we try to just load like Colada scenes directly, that was that was not going to that knew, we knew that it wasn't going to fly because even on a local server, uh, it would take a really long time to load. So like, even when bandwidth wasn't an issue, uh, we realized that the browser was just choking on these uh, megabytes of bytes. Um, so uh, just as an aside, Colada is still really useful in in other places like an asset pipeline. We we still do use it, but yeah, don't you don't want to be decoding it in in JavaScript. Um, and I mentioned uh, one of the reasons is performance, but the real reason is that it, it isn't designed to do this. Like uh, the way it formats your mesh data isn't a very convenient way to render. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, right, so, so ASCII is bad, JSON, XML, uh, not so good. Um, uh, one of the, I don't know if you saw uh, earlier, there was a demo, um, you know, a few, maybe it was last year, uh, when there was GWT Quake, which was the Quake 2 port to GWT and WebGL. Uh, and one, one complaint that they had was their loading was really, really slow because they had to do all these like bit twiddling things on text and converting the floats and stuff like that. Uh, and they were really happy when they got the typed array support and XML HTTP requests, the, basically the response blob and all that stuff. And uh, you know, it was something that they were looking for and uh, were very happy to receive. Uh, however, um, we do not use this. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Vangelis mentions that uh, we use 16 bits for our attributes, right? Because, you know, it, coming from a desktop world, uh, I think people like the, the convenience of floats, but it's way more precision than you, uh, than you actually need. Um, and uh, one of the things, one of the wins about going to a smaller Vertex format is not only do you win on the transmission, but you win on you know things like video memory and internal video bandwidth and all that good stuff. Um, although body in particular is uh, is dominated by texture use, but every little bit counts. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so right, this is how we uh, quantize our data in in body. Um, Basically, for our positions, our XYZ positions, we used 14 bits. For our normals, for our XYZs, we used 10 bits. And for our UVs, uh, we, use, we also used 10 bits. Uh, these were really, really conservative uh, values. So, I mean, just to give you an idea, um, 14 bits of position means that over, if you have a six foot object like a human, you have uh, almost one 250th of an inch resolution. And in metric, that's like, Know, you know, one eighth of a millimeter. It's it's pretty good. Um, and ten bits for normal, even that's probably overkill. You could probably get away with you know nine or even eight. Uh, and, and likewise for texture coordinates. Um, there there are a few things you need to look out for when you're quantizing, uh, especially for positions, and you're worried about your meshes lining up and stuff. Um, you should use the same bounding box, or like make sure that things are aligned on convenient power of two boundaries. Otherwise, you might get weird. Uh, weird scenes. Um, the, another thing is, you know, you kind of want to have uh, your bounding box around your positions be reasonably p tight, but you don't have to, you don't have to go crazy. Um, in fact, for body, I just use a cube. Uh, that way, each dimension was quantized at the same resolution. Uh, this sounds like we're going to be wasting a lot of space since there's a lot of unused values, uh, but we're actually just setting up for the next step. 
So uh, next slide. So obviously, what are we here for? Uh, we're, we're here to talk about compression. And um, the compression is going to, it is basically going to solve all those problems of wasted space and stuff like that. So it's important to think about compression not as this miraculous black box, because um, their behavior isn't really that hard to understand. Uh, if, you, if you have some kind of built-in compression, uh, and you have some idea of what kind of data it prefers, then you can use this knowledge to write simple preprocessors that will improve the compression. And you know, preprocessors themselves uh, can be compressors. You know, for example, gzip is effectively two stages, one for phrase matching and second for um, entropy code. Uh, so, so you have to be sensitive to things like what gzip is going to do uh, to avoid certain non-solutions. Like, I mentioned you know, these non-byte ordered uh, values, like 14 bits, 10 bits. They don't fit in evenly bytes. I think you might be tempted to try to cram them all uh, together into, you know, by doing some sort of bit packing thing. But this is really a lose-lose situation, because even though your stream into gzip is smaller, um, gzip doesn't really know how to operate on bits. It kind of only knows how to operate in bytes. So you end up reducing the compression ratio, and you'd have to deal with all this alignment and unpacking in JavaScript, which is nothing you want to, uh, nothing which you want to deal with. Um, yeah, so anyway, so we've reduced uh, this part of the problem to simply we should invent a compression preprocessor. So next slide, please. OK, so we got to look around and sort of get, get a lay of the land. Uh, so let's start with the bad news here. So I, I can't emphasize the simplicity. Uh, I didn't have much time to work on this. Um, you know, this is only a 20% project, and even then, this is, you know, not not the most important or visible part of the 20% project. This is something like we needed to get done so we could get the rest of the stuff working. Um, we want it to be, we want it to be, we want it to be minimal. We don't want to be doing a lot of fancy things. Uh, we don't want to have some special format that we have to later convert into a renderable format. We sort of need to just be as close to a, a, a as pass through as possible. Um, and of course, being fast in JavaScript is a real challenge. Like, uh, obviously, uh, we, we wouldn't have even thought of doing this, um, you know, a few years ago. But now, JavaScript performance on pretty much every browser is so fast, uh, we can start thinking about this. Um, but it's still a challenge. I mean, my day job is is optimizing native code, you know, as close to the metal as possible. So I kind of, you know, I kind of still shudder to think that JavaScript might be ten to a hundred times slower than what what I could have gotten in native code. Um, but you know what? It's good enough. And it's good enough because you're actually assisted by some, you know, some nice bits of infrastructure around you. So, uh, for one thing, something that you should have is some kind of asset pipeline. Um, basically, this is something that allows you to decouple a bunch of different things, like the authoring process uh, and the transmission format and the rendering format. They, they, they all have different goals, and using a pipeline. Uh, allows you to be aggressive about doing the preprocessing to optimize for all those different sorts of tasks. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that. That's just sort of you know general general knowledge here. Uh, caching is another interesting thing because obviously the fastest bits are the ones that you never have to send or never have to decode. Uh, so I mean it doesn't you know help with compression per se, but it it's really really important. Um, I could probably give another talk just on optimizing caching, but uh, we're not going to focus on that. So what else does HTTP give us? Uh, we have gzip, as I mentioned earlier, and something that I hadn't mentioned earlier, UTF-8, which is the default text transmission uh, uh, format for the web. And uh, by happy coincidence, UTF-8 and gzip uh, work quite nicely together because you know, UTF-8 is this byte-oriented format. And um, most importantly, these are all implemented in pretty optimized native code on your browser. So uh, even if these things aren't ideal, um, it's going to be better than what you can do in JavaScript. Next slide, please. Let's peek inside UTF-8. So UTF-8 is a standard Unicode text encoding for the web. Um, interestingly, even though that there are a million code points dividing, uh, defined in Unicode, um, JavaScript strings are only, only 16 bits. Um, but we can use this uh, weird little foible to, as, an, as a way to send 16-bit data. Like, all our attributes, all of our indices are 16 bits. So why not just pack them into, uh, into UTF-8? Uh, looking a little bit closer at UTF-8, uh, we, we see that larger characters um, are encoded with more bytes. So you know, the, the, ASCII, the ASCII characters, 0 to 127, only 
is encoded as one byte. This was an important feature to UTF-8 that's backwards compatibility with ASCII. And then, um, you know, some medium size up to 2048, uh, or 2047 rather, uh, we can encode it in two bytes and up to 65,536, which is the largest, um, I think that's a typo, should be 535, uh, is encoded in three bytes. Anyway, we don't really care about the four or five byte encodings this talk because we only care about 16 bits right now. Um, so th there is one thing that does get you here. And in this th lurking in this three byte range is, these, is this range of uh, code points called surrogate pairs. And this was sort of the workaround for the fact that, uh, that Java and JavaScript strings are 16 bit, even though Unicode is not 16 bit. Um, anyway, we're really not going to talk too much about that. Uh, um, you know, it has some caveats, but it turns out not to matter. So next slide, please. So if it wasn't, if it wasn't obvious, uh, you know, UTF-8, by its, because it's a variable length encoding, is a form of compression. Uh, so all we need to do is make the values you send UTF-8 smaller, and that will take advantage of uh, the variable with encoding. So, so look, let's take a, another look at our stack here. Uh, we've got gzip and UTF-8, some magic that happens in uh, JavaScript, and then WebGL. So, uh, you know, if you if you're looking if you're looking around, you see up you have all this like highly optimized native code, and below you you have like a hardware accelerator. So the thing in the middle has got to better be uh, you know pretty fast and not be a ridiculous bottleneck. So uh, we're constrained uh, to something very fast and simple, which is the next slide. So I'm afraid the the the, the I'm afraid it's somewhat anticlimactic uh, because all we do is delta encoding. Um, Basically, if you, if you don't know, uh, delta compression is simply sending the differences uh, between the data instead of the data itself. And it is really, really simple. So, so simple that the example, I think you can, you can just read and understand just by looking at this. So this is how encoding works. You have some input stream of numbers. And the desired output stream isn't the numbers itself, but the differences uh, between those numbers. So in this case, you have 100 and 110. The difference between 100 and 110 is 10. And then the difference between 110 and 107 is minus three. So the algorithm to generate this uh, data is very simple. All it requires one register of state and you know a subtraction. And otherwise, it's basically a them copy. Um, decoding next slide is similarly uh, similarly simpler. And you know this is the this is the thing that's going to uh, end up running in your JavaScript if you were to do it. So if you notice in my example, I kind of like picked a bunch of numbers around 100 to sort of show you that, you know, uh, if your numbers are kind of like all in the same area, you can end up with a much smaller set of numbers. And that is the sort of thing we want to exploit. Um, uh, there, there is one more, one more wrinkle in the next slide. Okay, the wrinkle is, is uh, two's complement kind of screws you over here because delta compression yields these signed results. Obviously, you want to both encode pluses and minuses, uh, plus positive and negative deltas. Uh, but UTF-8 encodes unsigned values, and if you try to just do the naive thing, you're kind of you're kind of screwed, <laughs> because um, as you see from the title of the slide, like something like minus one uh, gets mapped to a very very large number. Um, so what we kind of want to do is find a, a, a find some some way to interleave the values. So like as an example I have below, where zero is mapping to zero, uh, negative one to one, one to two, negative two, sort of like shuffling these guys together. If we need to find an encoding um, that does that as our next step, and hopefully it's fast. And I happen to have a solution in the oven for the next slide. Um, so fortunately, this is already a solved problem. Uh, Google has another uh, library called uh, Protobufs, and Protobufs use variable length integers by default to encode all, all, all the integer values. And so they have this thing called zigzag coding. Um, and you know, it's just some bit twiddling magic. You can stare at stare it here, but uh, I'll post the slides later so that you can, you know, really internalize it later. Next slide, please. Okay, so anyway, that, I just uh, want to pause here uh, to point out that we have a pretty good insight here that, uh, you know, delta coding as an idea isn't that impressive, but the insight is that we can get it really, really, really cheaply because uh, gzip and UTF-8 are handed to us already. Um, and that, that delta coding is very simple and zigzag coding is very simple. Um, so 
Yeah, we, we're close to have one. Uh, but the thing is, delta coding has this caveat. Like, it only makes, it only acts as compression if you manage to send coherent values. But I haven't really justified why, uh, why that's a reasonable expectation. So uh, in order to do that, let's look at the GL part of WebGL. Next slide. OK. So uh, this next bit uh, ought to be review for everybody. Um, basically, you know, for a very long time, OpenGL and, and, and now WebGL uh, likes to render index triangles. So what that means is that you have an array of attributes, which are things like position normals and text chords, and you, which are basically just a list of numbers. And you also have uh, an array of indices, which index into those attributes. So just as a quick aside, uh, OpenGL ES implementations typically like GL short as its format, uh, just because it's, it's smaller. Um, we kind of ran into a weird driver problem, which on certain platforms, uh, GL short on the desktop was really, really slow. So we actually ended up sending things as shorts, but uh, convert them to float. So that's a bit of a waste that I'd like to get rid of at some point. But anyway, um, there's something to look out for in case you choose to implement this yourself. Uh, but yeah, array of indices, again, also 16 bits, uh, unsigned shorts. So the reason why uh, index primitives are so good is because you can not only share the inputs, but you also share the outputs. Uh, there's this thing called a vertex cache. In fact, there, there are two, uh, at least when I was learning OpenGL. <laughs> there is both the post-transform and a pre-transform vertex cache. So the key insight here is that um, these caches are of finite size, which means that the savings, the benefit from doing indexing, only really helps you if uh, your index references occur within some small window. OK, um, so you want to pre-process your data so that your indexed uh, triangles uh, are vertex cache optimized. And there, there's two, two kinds of things. Uh, and they're, they're covered in this paper. I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Tom Forsyth, who wrote this, um, this great little web page called Linear Speed Vertex Cache Optimization. And it has a, has a lot of nice, uh, nice features. It's a fast, simple and also a, a cache oblivious uh, vertex optimizer that I, I suggest you check out. It doesn't take long to implement. I think it took me maybe three hours one weekend. Um, but it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I used. Uh, but in any case, um, let's, let's look at the next slide. So not only, so the thing that I'm driving at here is that. Uh, sorry, really quick. Uh, we, we'll, yeah. we'll need to wrap it up in a little bit. So just, just to let okay. you know. Okay, I think uh, I'm really close to the end. This is like basically the last interesting slide. <laughs> okay, so um, basically the second insight here is that uh, the coherence that makes things easily renderable is what makes it easily compressible. So you're looking at uh, the post-transform vertex cache, which is the thing that you're doing to maximize reuse for rendering performance, also improves the coherence of the indices. Uh, likewise, a pre-transform vertex cache, which this is the thing that regularizes memory access, uh, will cause your attribute ac attributes to be coherent. And this is what makes the delta compression actually works. Um, yeah, so if you don't do that, then you might, uh, then you might sort of lose out quite a bit. So uh, just putting it together in the next slide, um, I'll just quickly show you this bit of code. And this bit of code is effectively just putting together uh, the delta coding and the zigzag coding in one slide. It's not very much. Um, next slide. Uh, for attributes, it's a little bit more comp it's, it's bigger. I mean, it's not more complicated. It's just bigger because you need to kind of do delta encoding in parallel for each of the channels. Uh, it's unrolled uh, in a mind implementation, so it doesn't fit on the slide, but it's basically the same thing repeated eight times. Um, a, a few little tweaks here and there. You might want to consider a transposed representation, uh, which means that instead of sending interleaved x, y, z's, send all your x's and all your y's and all your z's. And that sort of gives GZIP a better a chance at adapting to the statistics of the different, uh, of the different value types. Um, another thing, uh, another thing, another trick that, uh, that you might want to do is that after you, after you decompress, you have to rescale your values. Um, and one cheap way to do that uh, is just to use the W coordinate in your vertex position. So that's a little bit of a vertex shader code uh, to help you do that in case you don't want to do it in JavaScript. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, anyway, 
that's basically it. Uh, the stack looks like this. Do some vertex cache optimization, quantize your data, delta code, zigzag, UTF-8, gzip. And that's what we do. Great. Excellent. OK. Thanks. So um, we are cutting into lunch, but that's because of all the projector stuff. So we're going to have the caterers to set up down the corner and then um, take the Q&A uh, real fast. And then uh, by the time they're done setting up, I think we're done with the Q&A. So Greg, you had a question? Oh, you don't have one. You just have the mic. There's a question over here. One second. Please introduce yourself. Hi, this is Remy. Um, I got a question because um, several years ago, um, the MPEG for uh, 25 committee published a standard on how to do uh, compression of 3D data, where they apply a different type of compression algorithm based on what the data is. So there's a better compression if it's indexes or if it's geometry. I mean, the different algorithms are applied to those different things. and. Uh, they uh, published that um, spec and also implementation. Uh, so I'm wondering if you had any chance to look at that. Uh, they've been doing some uh, uh, FT research there, and it looks like their results to how to compress and send uh, 3D data is uh, uh, pretty astonishing on, on, on the result. Uh, so if, if you had a chance to look at that for something as big as the human body, that could be uh, really worth it, I think. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that work, but yeah, I'll, t I'll take a look. Any other question? Any remaining blood sugar? That was a great talk, by the way, but we're a little late and we're cutting into lunch. So I'm going to thank you from over there. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thanks.